it's with great pleasure that um, I welcome Yolande Klassen uh, today to um, come and join us and uh, talk to us about what um, I think will be an absolutely fascinating subject. All of us um, use and wear clothes and all of us have some kind of in, um, uh, interaction with the world of fashion and clothing manufacture. So it's something that affects all of us. I think all of us are more and more aware um, that uh, environmental consequences of everything we do, whether it be traveling, whether it be heating our homes, whether it be the clothes we wear or the food we eat, um, is something that we need to take more and more into consideration. So um, without further ado, we'll launch into some questions with your land. Um, so the first thing I would very much like to ask you is, um, having spoken with you several times to prepare the event um, today, um, when I, whenever I talk to you about upcycling, sustainable fashion, um, uh, all these issues around the world of fashion and, and the environment, um, we really get the feeling that this is a passion, a kind of sort of personal mission for you. So where does all that come from? Where, where did you get this um, desire to, to launch your own business um, and to be involved in this uh, world of sustainable fashion? Um, well, hello, Ian. Hello, everybody. Very nice to be uh, invited uh, to, to share with you uh, this passion that you're, you're referring to. Um, I have, just to give you a bit of perspective on, on me talking today, is that I've spent uh, the past 20 odd years, probably about 25 years, working in the fashion industry, uh, be it clothing, be it footwear, be it accessories. Uh, I was a buyer. I was a, a buyer um, for Marks and Spencer. So, so the Brits online will, will remember what Marks and Spencer was <laughs> in those days, um, buying for, for international markets for them. And then I moved to um, a company called Timberland, which you might know as well, um, who is a very sort of understated company um, who, who left actually a big mark on me, a big uh, footprint, excuse the, the pun, <laughs> um, because you know 20 years ago, they were already very, very consciously um, reducing their carbon footprint in everything they did. So it, for me, it was something when I first arrived there, uh, you know, 18, 20 years ago, you know, when we're at the peak of, you know, consumerism, um, I was thinking, who are these crazy guys trying to get organic cotton in their ranges and recycle, you know, tires to the soles of the shoes and doing community service and auditing their factories? Why are they spending all this time and money doing this? And even the stock market at the time were asking them questions about why they were doing it. But it actually sowed a seed deep in me um, about sort of doing business, but doing business well uh, with, with good conditions uh, from, and respectfully in terms of the humans we deal with, um, the, peoples in our, the people in our communities, and also the actual products we're producing. So I've been passionate and, and contributed to probably a lot of you know, uh, carbon in the environment with my past career. Um, I thought it was time, you know, at my, my age in life to actually uh, have a meaningful input into this market that I still so love. Um, I, so I spent sort of 20 years working for brands, international expansion, retail, franchise, etc. Did an expatriation out in Russia for a few years. And about seven years ago, I moved back to France in the north of France here in Lille. And it was great to see um, a rekindling of the textile industry in this region, which is the, the foothold of textile um, in France, but also in Europe. Um, mm. And it was great to see there was a real uh, energy here to actually sort of rekindle the textile market. The, the Made in France was coming back. And this really struck a note and it rekindled this little sort of fire in me about sustainable business around the fashion market. And so, that planted the seed to, to, for me to start up a business uh, in upcycling fashion. So, you, so your business is, is called um, Revive Clothing Lab. And as yeah. we can see from what you've just said, you know, it's, it's the, um, the, the result of a, of a career within the fashion industry. And then your desire to, to put something back and to do something that is relevant to, to um, the environmental issues that everybody's um, uh, interested in and concerned about today. So um, the other theme that I, I, I can hear very strongly and something obviously we spoke about preparing the, the event is um, the uh, revival and renewal of an old uh, textile area. Um, so I can see lots of interesting themes, th themes that we're going to be able to explore today. Um, but 
imagine somebody was starting out in the fashion industry today. What, what would you say were the key opportunities? What would you say would be something that's, that's, that's new and exciting to be um, involved in if, if you were just starting out today, if somebody was just starting out today? Um, I would say, um, I think that the big theme and the future is sustainable. Uh, yeah. It's rather a, an overused word at the moment, but um, we, we've seen the emergence of sustainable and, and conscious consumption from the mobility market in terms of the explosion of, you know, what people sort of sniffed at, you know, the electric cars or electric bike with bicycles. So, you know, it wasn't particularly considered mainstream in the past, but now has become mainstream in, in certain other sectors. Uh, the whole sort of, you know, war on plastic in the food market. Um, the fact that, you know, now buying things, uh, what do they call it, en vrac, I can't even remember what it is in, in English, you know, but sort of like, you know, free, serve yourself, you know, zero packaging um, groceries. Uh, I remember that the sort of like the organic section in a supermarket was a, a sort of a, a funny little wooden rack at the end of a gondola. Yep. Uh, but now, you know, it's probably about a quarter of the offer in supermarkets. So yep. sustainable is the future of fashion as well, because we've definitely been behind the other sectors and that in all senses of the world and touching all parts of um, of the industry is definitely the future. Yeah, and I'd like to talk to that because it is a real sort of, um, you know, a, a circular process developing a product. Um, and creating a, a garment, a product to go to market. And there are so many different steps in that that need to be made more sustainable, that that is definitely the future for, for somebody starting out in the fashion industry today. Yeah, yeah. So that is, it's true that there's been a huge media focus recently uh, over the past few years around these issues. So um, I understand you've got some slides um, to share with us, which, um, which will highlight some of the points that you've just made and, and enable us to... Um, uh, go through in, in, in a bit more detail some of the subjects that that, that we're we're going to look at. Um, would, would you like to perhaps start and comment some of those slides, and then and I've got another absolutely. question. That I think that'll lead into. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can just to, to give some backdrop to the the fashion market. I think we can pop up a slide here, which is uh, uh, the the second one that was just uh, there. We go. So some pretty ugly images here. I just wanted to put on the the. Uh, on the page because the audience here today, some people might be familiar with the, the fashion industry, some might not be. Um, but, you know, why is sustainable the order of the day and why is it so important? Because the impact that the fashion industry and the textile industry has on the planet is pretty disastrous actually. And the scientifics and various sort of activists and, you know, key personalities like a, a Ellen MacArthur, for example, uh, who's got an incredible foundation that is really, um, you know, fighting to save this planet, um, have really brought to light with scientific evidence that the, the fashion market, the clothing market is actually the second most polluting in the world after the petrol industries. And, you know, from these nice garments that we put on every day that are sort of bulging out of our, our cupboards and, are, you know, we're all flocking to the shops now, buying again, now we're allowed to. Um, it, it's a pleasurable thing to, to, to be in fashion and to love fashion and to wear garments. However, we've got to look behind those labels and see what's really happening. Um, the impacts are, are, have really emerged over the past sort of 15 years because during this spell, the market has been pretty much stagnant um, however, the volume, so that's the sort of the turnover of the market, the volume, uh, every year there's about 100 billion new garments that are put into the market every yeah. year. And, you know, the, the volume has tripled in the past 15 years, but it's a market that's stagnant. So that means, you know, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to do the maths there, that the garments, the integrity of the garments is, and the price of these garments is dropping. Yep. And, you know, I keep saying this, look beyond the label. If you're paying a garment the same price as your sandwich, you know, th there's something wrong there because you can't produce clothing for, you know, a euro or two euros a, a piece. Uh, either it, there's a human rights issue behind that because people aren't yep. being properly paid or in terms of the actual materials and how they're being made, the quality of the factories it's being made in, there's definitely an issue. And, and here on the page, 
<clears throat> there are a few images that are not very pretty, but when you look at the actual waste, the piles of garments that are on the market, um, you know, this fast fashion, yeah, okay, everybody loves Zara and H&M and everything. And I, I'm not criticizing them because, you know, they give a lot of pleasure and make a lot of, you know, create a lot of employment. However, pushing, uh, you know, so many collections per year, sometimes it's 12, 15 collections per year, you know, it, it's this sort of bulimia of the market that is actually um, uh, creating all this wastage. So, so what you're saying is, is, is that economically the industry is kind of treading water it's not making significantly more money and yet it's producing more and more and more clothes for not necessarily not necessarily having a which are ending up in in landfill you know because the garments aren't of great quality so people have we've moved into this sort of throwaway society sadly so you know people are buying you know clothes at you know 10 20 20 euros a piece you know uh, they'll they'll wear them once or twice, and then what do they do with them? You know, they're, they're teased by the the seductive marketing uh, yep. to you know, and this whole sort of image, you know, image society. When you look at the way that the social networks are, are very much sort of image focused, people are just even getting garments to take a photo in, even in the yep. dressing rooms, you know, or the, the fitting rooms of shops. So it's this pushing consumption that has led to this huge explosion in volume, and behind that is the huge wastage. Because it, uh, you know, about eighty percent of it or whatever um, uh, ends up in landfill. Uh, yeah. Yes, there are there are secondhand shops and what have you. And yes, we try and recycle, but there is a huge amount that is dumped in deepest, darkest, you know, mountains in Germany or yeah. sent off to to underdeveloped countries, uh, supposedly sold to them, but it ends up in landfill there. Uh, the fact that um, in the, the process of manufacturing, which we talked about, very low cost that the factories aren't geared up to really recycle, for example, their wastewaters, you know, all the dye stuffs uh, end up in the actual drinking water in some of these underdeveloped um, companies, uh, countries. And, you know, when you look at the actual uh, integrity of the garment by using a lot of synthetics, which are cheaper than natural fabrics, um, those synthetic fabrics, when you're washing them in your washing machine, are ending up in your plate because, you know, it's going into the the um, the water table uh, from your washing machines, and basically, you know, the the, uh, the wildlife is consuming this, be it the birds, be it the, the fish or whatever, and we're ending yeah. up that in our plate. So there is a huge impact there. The use of natural resources, the cotton growing to nourish the market. You, we know how intensive that is in terms of space, uh, good arable land, and also water. Mm -hmm. Um, And the actual water consumption, you know, they say that to do a T-shirt, to make a T-shirt or a jean, you know, it's it's thousands and thousands, about 3000 litres of water just to actually make a a new jean, a new garment. So, you know, this overconsumption and overproduction is actually really, really um, degrading the natural resources of the planet. You know, without even talking of the the human, the human rights issues in some of this low cost manufacturing. So, so that's the situation now. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the options, one of the solutions, and this is the, the solution that you're championing, is to move towards um, uh, what we call a circular com- economy model. Yeah. So what are the challenges that the, the fashion industry has now to move from a situation that we can see is clearly unsustainable towards a model which is more sustainable uh, and perhaps um, uh, benefits um, uh, the economy uh, and society more widely? Absolutely. Um, The circular economy, I think it might be interesting just to look at the slide that represents the sort of circularity of uh, um, of the market. Sorry, it's in French, but I think everyone online here should be able to understand that one. There's some nice little pictograms there so we can follow that. So, you know, the circularity means that, you know, we have several lives within a life and, and You know, it's not a linear sort of you make something, you sell it, you consume it, it's dead. Uh, We're talking about giving a second life or a third life or several lives to product. Um, And the circularity actually has to start at the sort of conception level. Um, You know, when when designers are thinking about a product and we're talking about textile here, but it, it could be any product, it could be cars, it could be other things. The fact that when it's purposely um, designed, this will bear in, bear in mind, can it be dissembled to be recycled? Uh, are the fabrics and the, the sort of details I'm putting in this garment, this product that I'm designing, 
Are they, um, you know, respectful of the planet? You know, are they organic? Are they, you know, um, sustainable? So that's really important from a, a conception point of view, uh, that the thinking of the end of life um, in terms of how it's being made, you know, in terms of the quality of the factories. I was talking about that just a minute ago about, you know, do they have facilities to recycle their waters and have solar energy, et cetera. So that's a big consideration in terms of choice of factories and, and manufacturing uh, solutions. Um, thinking about the actual economic model. Um, here we talked about the economy de la fonctionnalité. So rather than just doing sort of, you know, uh, transfer of ownership. So I go into a shop and I buy a product, it's mine. Uh, it's life ends up in my closet and potentially in landfill. Uh, do we have to own, you know, can we just do rentals? This has happened in the car market and the mobility market. Why not transfer these ideas to the clothing sector? And this is increasingly, um, it, it's growing. It's definitely growing. It's becoming sort of more mainstream. I think it was Rent the Runway, which was an American concept that started this off. But increasingly now here in, in Europe and in France, there are solutions that you can rent, you can rent your clothes and not just occasion wear, but everyday clothes. Um, so this is an interesting, uh, um, you know, take on making, you know, having several lives for a garment because it can be rented and be put back on the market. So, um, sorry, bringing, bringing that back to your business then. Yeah. Um, your business is very much involved with the, with the notion of upcycling. Could you yep. give us a bit more information on what upcycling actually means and what it is? What, what Absolutely. Is, what, what, yeah. In fact, I'm just coming on to that, actually, because yep. in this little circular document, and then we can take it off the screen, but just, just to talk about that, because, you know, we're talking about the different solutions to actually prolong and, and extend the life cycle of a product so yep. that we're not just schlepping out these hundreds of millions and, uh, of, gar of new products in the market. You can have rental, you can have secondhand, yep. you can have repairal, you know, reuse, re, re, uh, you know, re, uh, repair, recycle. Uh, the adages of our grandparents and our parents of generations before, they used to repair things. You know, our throwaway culture is just sort of, you know, it's pretty cheap. Uh, I might as well just throw it away and buy a new one. So I think we're, we're moving away from that spirit and looking at repairing again, like our generations before us did. Uh, reuse, you know, think of a, a new use for it and to, to recycle. And, and this is this new use, which is the sort of upcycling that you, you're referring to, Ian. Yeah. Um, what does upcycling mean? It means really giving a new life and a new value to something that was considered maybe dead stock or worthless. Um, you, you see it in uh, furniture, people upcycle furniture, something that could have been, you know, left on the street to be taken away. People are upcycling it. You know, there's a lot of it is DIY uh, to give it a new life, a new lease of life. What I'm doing in the clothing market is that um, I, I was absolutely acutely aware of the excess inventory that was always there at the end of season. Yeah. Um, nobody has the crystal ball that, that can predict exactly the the you know, the buying trends and, and to, or sorry, the selling trends to know what consumers are going to buy. So there's always been excess and unsold inventory. So what I do is that I deal with um, retailers to mm -hmm. buy up their old inventory. I pick from that the items that I want. I then restyle it with a team of designers. We reinvent. And from that unused, unsold, obsolete inventory, we cre create value. We redesign and we make desirable, uh, unique or mini series sort of products that we, we sell. And we also work with um, brands who have significant inventory to actually work with them to develop capsule collections from their dead stock because it gives it a new lease of life uh, where a garment might have just been badly cut or uh, you know, something like that, or the sizing was wrong, you know, we can correct that and reinvent it. Um, and increasingly, the market is really open to this sort of solution. So upcycling is really giving a, a new lease of life to something and to revalue it, sur, sur um, to make it desirable and to make it saleable and, and valuable to somebody. Okay, that's very interesting. So on a, on a business level, then you're actually working within a company, to help them recycle their stock and to help them reuse their stock to sell. Uh, and you'd also be taking stock and then selling it through other channels. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's right. We do, um, you know, we have, the, there are three areas of activity. We we have our own brand, Revive Clothing Lab, which is, you know, this stock that we bought up from the independent retailers. Uh, it, it's circular for them as well, because by, you know, taking that off their hands, it frees up some treasury. It frees yep. up space in their stores. Um, and also it avoids, um, you know, going to potentially landfill. Uh, and now that, uh, as you might know, in France, you know, the, there is legislation that has been passed, the sort of the anti-waste legislation, which, first of all, uh, came about for food, but it's now being acted upon for the textile industry. So they can no longer destroy the, the old inventory, burn it or whatever, or, you know, yep. purposely. So, so I do that with that stock. We make our collections that we sell online on our website. Uh, we do pop-up stores, for example, been, you know, had some, some ephemeral stores, pop-up stores in Lille. Currently, a more permanent location. I'm in the Pantin department store in Lille. Yeah. And we're working with them to extend this to other stores because for them, a light has gone on and I'm delighted with that. They're a great partner because they were very much a sort of a temple of, of you know, instant gratification and, you know, just buy, consume and keep consuming. Yeah. And they've seen the fact that the consumer demand is changing and people are looking for more local, more unique and more responsible fashion. So we're collaborating with them in two ways. We have our own products sold there, but we also do capsule collections for them from their dead stock, which is co-branded. But sometimes we do. It's just even the sort of like um, unbranded we accompany um, we are company retailers to actually find a solution for their dead stock. So that, that brings but they sell in their chains of stores. Yeah. That brings me on to an interesting point. You mentioned um, local manufacturing and, and yeah. obviously Pranton is, is a national brand, but they have very strong presence in, in, in um, uh, you know, city, uh, city centers, uh, one of the essential sort of um, um, uh, um, brands within, within city centers. So um, what, what role does local production and manufacturing have in the future of fashion then because I, I you know we, we've, we've lived through this phase of everything being outsourced and sent to China and Vietnam and Bangladesh and what have you and, and um, products being shipped in uh, by, by the container load um, presuming you're part of this re, re um, location of, of manufacturing and industrial capacity back to European shores and back to local areas yeah absolutely yeah there has been a huge um well, there's been an acceleration of this uh, thinking, uh, particularly following this pandemic, because uh, as we know, you know, um, continents have been pretty much shut off and that has impacted lots of, you know, trade channels. Um, but the inflexibility of uh, offshore and, and you know, um, faraway manufacturing has started to weigh heavily in terms of the economic um, performance of companies. Um, can, you know, consumer, uh, uh, consumers are, are very difficult to predict. Um, there's so many different changes at the moment. You know, you can have, uh, when you're a garment retailer, you know, you, you buy up for the fall, uh, lots of outerwear, lots of heavy garments and everything. But with the global warming, the fact that you might have a sort of an Indian summer in October, it really, you know, shoots the bottom out of your, your revenue plans and all your buying plans for a winter season when you can't cut your production because you committed to it six months ago and it's already yep. been, you know, it's on a ship it's on its way over from Asia, you're really in the, <laughs> yes. you know, you're in the deep end. Um, so I think the inflexibility of having this sort of long-term manufacturing and far away and inflexible um, buying has really hit home. Um, the conditions in some of the factories as well has really hit home as well. Uh, there was a big crisis in 2013 in Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a human disaster there where um, a factory actually collapsed on the workers in there. Yeah, I think many um, of us remember that, yeah. 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 So, you know, I think people are starting to think, you know, we, we want to buy clothing and enjoy fashion, but not at any cost. Mm -hmm. So there has been thinking to say, okay, you know, um, we can't be dependent on you know, Asian manufacturing, look what's happened in the past 12 months, um, to have a shorter lead time, to um, have a better quality garment, which responds to what we were saying before about moving away from the throwaway culture, yeah. but have a garment that maybe, okay, it's not tip 
hip-hop fashion, but maybe it's something that's more sort of, you know, timeless fashion, but it's great quality. It's the great cut jean. Uh, I'm thinking of a, a French manufacturer called 1083. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard of them, but they're, they're, they've been going for, for several years now, but are really coming into their own now. And why 1083? It's the number of kilometers uh, from the top to the bottom of France, basically mm-hmm. saying that their garments... Uh, have not traveled more than those 1,083 kilometers to be made. And they're all made within the hexagon, which is fantastic. And it's a reasonably priced gene. Yeah, of course, it's not your anti-price point, but, you know, it's a gene for around, uh, you know, 100 euros and they're doing it made in France. So there is a lot of energy using, um, you know, embracing the sort of the old know-how of the industry in France. So we still need people who know how to use sewing machines and, you know, the old style um, manufacturing, but with embracing the new technologies, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, using all the algorithms of, of buying in terms of styles and colors and sizes from the industry, and then capturing that to be able to make it locally. So th- there's a company called Take-In. Yep. Um, they, do, uh, they do this sort of like short time, sort of just in time manufacturing for several brands now in France, and they're extending very rapidly across Europe. So they're basically using this artificial intelligence to sort of capture the, the you know, the algorithms and, and the trends and the actual sales history uh, in season of brands to actually quickly react and make up the right garments in the right sizes and the right fabrics to be sold in season. Which, so of course, when, reduces waste because if it's the right time at the right time, then people are, are, are Plus you have once and not throwing it away. And, and, and you haven't got all the cost of and transportation and everything. Absolutely, yeah. 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 So there is a real move towards a more local manufacturing, but also, you know, not in the old-fashioned traditional way. You know, it's like the, the not 2.0, but manufacturing 3.0 yep. in France to be more flexible, more sustainable. Um, and a smarter way of manufacturing and replying to the, the changing demands and quickly changing demands in the market. So, so can I ask you a question about the cultural impact of this? Because obviously the, the, when the manufacturing was moved offshore and moved abroad, a lot of areas, um, you know, we saw it in the north of England, the north of France, mm-hmm. um, uh, particularly towns and cities that relied on the textile trade um, as, as their main uh, industrial um, uh, reason for being and, and, and their main source of income and employment. Uh, there was obviously a decline in those areas. Are we now seeing a revival in those areas and we now seeing a sort of a cultural impact as well um, uh, in those areas from the, uh, the reshoring of these, uh, these jobs and the reshoring of the, this industry? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I can speak about, which is a bit weird for the girl from the north of England, incapable of talking about what's happening in the north of England. Uh, however, I can talk about what's happening in the north of France. Yep. Um, uh, as most people will, will know, you know, uh, the the Eau de France, the north of France, and the, particularly Roubaix, yep. um, has been a historical textile town for, you know, um, be it yarns, be it actual fabrics, be it, you know, um, uh, manufacturing, uh, which died the death with the offshoring, as you know. Mm. Uh, what is incredible is that there's been a huge investment in terms of um, supporting startups, uh, supporting associations. Uh, I'm a member of a, of a great association, which used to be called Norcrea, but it's now mm. called Fashion Green Hub. Uh, because it was basically founded by a group of absolutely passionate sort of ex-buyers, ex, you know, um, uh, sort of business people in the fashion industry who said, you know, let's stop this, you know, wastage, let's stop this sort of, um, um, it's not not quite this slide yet, but we'll get there. (laughs) Um, There is another way of, of doing fashion. And so from that has emerged, you know, this um, a group of it started off with sort of 10, 20 sort of startups around them. Some of the big um, uh, companies in the region, um, the the big retailers, national retailers, international retailers have joined the association because what we want to do is sort of share ideas as to how to to build a smarter uh, textile industry back in these regions. There's still a heck of a lot of know-how uh, there is still a heck of a lot of machinery. Um, yep. For example, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of sort of like um, uh, smaller um, uh, manufacturing um, 
uh, what you call it, uh, uh, factories, small yep. factories that are, have been popping up and they're getting bigger and bigger, uh, using the old um, tools and, and, and machinery that existed, but doing it in a much smarter way. So there's a whole so, uh, ecosystem. Embracing 3D thing. and absolutely, yeah. Yep. Um, good. But we're very lucky here in the North as well to have sort of design schools, fashion design schools, who were mm -hmm. working with the big retailers, who are working with the smaller workshops who are getting bigger and bigger, but they're, they're using new tools and embracing new top technology, as I say, to sort of recreate um, upcycling. Uh, yeah. The fact that, you know, uh, the, there's lots of big retailers here are doing these pop-up, uh, sorry, these, these sort of upcycle collections, which are made locally here in this region. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, there is a renaissance there and it's stimulating people like myself to actually think of launching a concept with a true mission behind it, yeah. um, which is regenerating, um, you know, economic value, employment within this region. Uh, so it's bringing hope and jobs back to areas where there's been high unemployment, where there, there's been sort of social fracture and what have you. Absolutely, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so I, I want to move on to a slightly, uh, a slightly different subject away from this, the, the industrial and cultural impact. Um, Many of our clothes now are made of artificial materials. Um, we also rely quite a bit on cotton, which is, uh, you know, we've, we've already mentioned, which is uh, um, quite heavy water use. It needs to be shipped in and what have you. Um, what do you think about um, alternative materials? Because hemp and linen, which were used, say, two, 150, 200 years ago, but are now starting to come back into fashion, if you excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> what do you think about these alternative materials? Do, do, do you think that um, there's, there's a, a big future for them? And, and do you think they'll change the way that we consume materials, the materials that go into fashion products? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you're right. Uh, I think everybody in, in the sort of 70s or whatever, the El Dorado was all the synthetics, the polyesters, yeah. the nylons and everything. You know, we recall those awful nightwear garments and everything we had and the you know and then polyester was the big thing you know we realized how bad they are for the climate the use of fossil fuels etc uh, everything we talked about before um linen and cotton have always been the good old uh, you know naturals um cotton however is so so intensive uh, it uses so much water in yep. terms of you know the irrigation needed to actually grow it uh, the, the need for great arable lands to be used to actually grow cotton. Yep. Um, you know, so, some countries, you know, developing countries, you know, their, their water supplies have been dried up, like the Aral, Aral Sea we've talked about. Um, great arable land that should be, you know, producing food for these countries is being used to grow cotton because it has yep. a higher commercial value. At yep. what price? You know, starving nations. Yep. So cotton isn't such a great solution um a cotton in the traditional sense of growing it but you're right hemp and linen are much less uh water consuming yeah. um they biodegrade on the land that they've grown on and can be grown on lands that are not so precious in terms of arable farming uh in it's fact also, the Flandre, also in terms of climate you can perhaps grow linen uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a climate that's, that's um, uh, less hot and... and uh, Absolutely. It's great, for example, you know, the Flandre, the, the northern region of France and Belgium yeah. here in the Flanders region, you know, <clears throat> I think it supplies something like, I don't know what, three quarters of the, of the linen production for the world, you know, the supply yeah. of the world, which is fantastic because it's a good damp <laughs> environment that sort of naturally irrigates it and, um, and the land isn't too, too precious in terms of, you know, farming. Mm -hmm. But there are other solutions as well, you know, they're the natural ones, but there are some incredible innovations out there, something like, for example, you know, Pinatex, um, sounds a bit of an odd word, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, Pinatex is from pineapple, just to correct okay. anybody thinking otherwise here. But yeah. Pinatex is um, made out of, of pineapple husks. So there is so much innovation going on there that, that, you know, finding a sort of like almost a replacement for, for, for leather or, or other from, from different, um, different materials like that. Um, you, you know, that there is a huge amount of innovation, you know, in the market, bringing in new materials so, all the time. So a material from pineapple husks then is, is uh, a material that would have been thrown away, recycling the material. Absolutely, yeah. away, um, Absolutely. Finding a new use for, for a material that exists. Yeah, and that's sort of from, you know, from, from natural, you know, natural sources, 
But, you know, there are a lot of brands as well looking at sort of, you know, again, on this upcycling angle, you know, really um, looking at a whole different use. You know, the, there's uh, a, a great couple of brands in this region, uh, La Via Belt, there's uh, Saint-Lazare. They're using uh, bicycle tires and linings from TGV trains to make accessories, yep. you know. So, uh, OK, they're not maybe the most uh, natural fabrics, but it's extending the life of these fabrics to yep. give them a new purpose and not consuming natural resources, which is really important. And you're also saying that for waste clothing, um, there are other uses like insulation or... or yeah, or, um, absolutely. Or have you, yeah? Absolutely. I mean, the, we, we didn't quite touch on that yet, but obviously, you know, garments, we try to recycle and there are huge industrial organizations who work on recycling with the industrial process of breaking down a fabric to recycle it. it it's a very complex process, particularly when there are mixed, um, mixed um, fabrics in a garment, you know, when you've got a mix of viscose with nylon, with cotton, you mm -hmm. know, the process to actually separate each respective element of that are actually quite quite complex. So it's easier when a garment is 100% something, be it polyester or what have you. But yeah, there, there are some great initiatives to recycle polyester, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we all know about the Patagonia that did recycling plastic bottles to make their yep. famous fleece jackets. You know, yep. that's been yep. going on for a long time, but yep. there is a great effort in recycling silk as well. But the only thing is from silk, from cotton, from polyester, because it's a recycled um, yarn, it's not quite as pure as the initial yarn. So sometimes the color is slightly off. I mean, it's getting a lot better, but sometimes the yarn count, you know, the, the density, the, the, the length of the yarn is a bit shorter. So it's not quite the same look and feel. Uh, but, you know, even people like, you know, the premium houses like Chanel and what have you are looking at doing this uh, mm -hmm. to embrace these recycled yarns into their collections, which is really good. But as you were saying, sometimes the 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 matter the the sorry the materials that we can't recycle are being sort of compacted together. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some great initiatives. For for example, there's a, a young uh, woman who who launched Fabrique, as yep. in you know Fabrique, but also brick, yep. and all the sort of end of you know little cut off uh, pieces of fabric. She is basically compacting them. Um, not using a chemical process, but sort of more sort of natural sort of enzymes and what have you to yep. compact them and to actually make bricks. And those bricks are being used to, um, you know, in some store build outs in the, in the fashion world, there's some of the local retailers who, who are using that and also to in, um, have sort of like soundproofing walls within buildings and offices. So that's a really great use of, of recycling. Construction material and insulating material. So, so all these new economies and new businesses are popping up around this sort of circular, the circular economy um, around the, the, the clothing and the, and the garment industry. Okay, so I've, I've got a couple of other questions. Would you like perhaps to look at the, the last couple of slides that you want to Absolutely, I think we can move on to the one that just sneakily on, popped up before. <laughs> So talking about, you know, what, what are all these solutions that are emerging in the market? You know, I, I might have painted a pretty black picture about, you know, the carbon footprint, the, mm -hmm. you know, the wastage, the landfill and everything. But it, there are many bright things happening. I think the good news is, is that there is a, a, um, a consciousness that has, has really uh, developed, uh, particularly in the past year as well, uh, which has been accelerated by this pandemic. Um, the fact that, you know, some of the, the sort of activists have really put it on the, the page that we now have solutions that are in the market. You know, we want to continue enjoying uh, fashion. You know, it, uh, apparently there's been a, um, uh, an Ipsos study, I think, that said that, that asked people about the impact of fashion on people's well-being, you mm -hmm. know, how they felt, you know. Yeah. And I think nearly, I think it was over three quarters of people who replied said that how people dress, it makes a huge impact in terms of their state of mind um, yeah. in their life. So, yeah. you know, when you dress well and you feel good in what you're wearing, be it, you know, the quality of your garments or the expression of your personality, you know, it impacts considerably how you're feeling about your life. So, yeah. you know, we, we need to deal with that. So the good thing is, is that there's lots of, uh, big retailers who are taking on board uh, the need to have a more sustainable offer. 
um, even people like H&M, you know, the Pinatech I talked about before, they're embracing that in their collections. Mm -hmm. uh, they're moving on to, you know, they've been putting in place, you know, collecting points in their stores so you can bring back garments to be resold and you get a sort of a voucher to spend in their shops and whatever. Uh, they've actually set up a, a repair. They call it Take Care, a repair center. So you can go and repair uh, this machines there. Um, you can repair your garments. Um, the group Galerie Lafayette um, and La Redoute, uh, who are significant retailers, as you know, have got the Go for Good initiative where they're really consciously trying to, to um, empower their partners as well as their own brands to actually take on a sustainable strategy from ecoception right through to, to how they dispose of their, their garments. And as you know, uh, La Redoute put in place La, La Reboucle, which is a secondhand platform, a bit like Vinted. I think many people will have heard that word and that name Vinted, which yep. is that sort of, you know, business to, con or sorry, consumer to consumer platform where you can trade your, your old garments, you know, and have a secondhand market direct to consumers. And La Redoute have put their own in place called La Reboucle. So, um, you know, they're, they're the giants of e-com and they've used their know-how in the digital world to actually put that in place, which is great. Um, Jack Adi, there's just a few examples here, Sierra Luz, um, the group Fashion Cube, which is a big local north of France um, retailer, clothing mm -hmm. retailer, which is part of the, the Mulier galaxy. Um, they've put in place a whole secondhand offer there, rewear. They've got capsule collections of upcycled garments. And I think you know, the cherry on the cake is that they're opening um, manufacturing units here in the north of France which yeah. is, I think, is an incredible thing to see, you know, the, the pillars of, of retailing actually investing in manufacturing in France again. So yeah. there's lots of solutions and, and good news happening in the market. And that's without talking about all the little startups like me who are there sort of also, you know, jumping up and down, making things happen uh, at, a, at a smaller scale. But we hope to be able to scale that up too in yeah. partnering with some of these bigger guys to actually... Uh, optimize our impact and accelerate the movement so so um, i mean that that gives us lots of hope and, and it comes on you know it's perfect for, for the, the last question that i was going to ask which is why should we be optimistic about the future of fashion we've got lots of reasons there is there any one reason that really springs to mind as to why we should be optimistic about the future well, you know i think consumers are speaking with their feet and and yeah. i think there's this consciousness that everybody realizes that it's in our hands you know and every little change that we can make even if it's just one garment you know if everybody here today who's connected to this call if we just say instead of buying one new garment i'm going to use what i've got in my wardrobe by upcycling it or you know or selling it so it can have a second hand use and extend the life of it if everybody could do that with one garment instead of buying one new garment the impact could be massive. So I, I think the great thing is, is that we're not, it's not a, a sort of a, how can I say, we're not restricting people's pleasure of fashion. It's just an opportunity to contribute. And it's easy. You know, we're not saying we've got to be nuclear physicists to actually do this. Uh, we can actually make the choice and it's in our hands. And I think the great thing is, is that people are realizing that. And, you know, I see it myself. We opened up yesterday in the Panton again, you know, at last non-essential, uh, uh, goods uh, and shops are open yeah. again <laughs> and it was fantastic to see people really really curious and really um, wanting to find more responsible solutions by fashion yeah, yeah. So, so, so the main reason for optimism is that that's what people believe in that's what people are starting to do yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, I will throw it open now. If people want to message a question, if they've got a specific question, then they can oh gosh. <laughs> message through. Um, we, we've got about 10 minutes uh, remaining. So hopefully I'll be able to get um, a couple of um, questions in. So I can see we've got uh, two just come through from George. Hi, George. Thanks very much. So um, first of all, in your opinion, what is the most shocking thing that's still happening in this industry? The pool. The, there are plenty there are plenty um, there's still sadly um, a lot of people who are not paid a decent yeah. wage for what they're manufacturing which is then uh, sold 
horribly share for the price of the actual garment. Um, yeah, so it's a, a real inequality between what people are getting paid. Absolutely, for the, you know, the there's a real human. The garment's actually being sold. Absolutely. For. So that is one of many. But the other thing is, is still the fact that you know there's this overconsumption and the wastage. Yeah. It's it's just massive. So. The list is long, but, you know, I would say those, the two if things. We, that, if we could me, work yeah. all of us together towards trying to solve yeah. two problems, it would be that, those yeah. two. Yeah, and look behind the label, you know. You, you never get a free lunch, as they say. You know, if that garment is, you know, two, three euros, yeah. I think you've got to ask the question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, another question has come through. What is the most creative innovation that you've seen? Oh, creative innovation. Well... Um, oh, there, there are so many different things, you know, I was just talking, you know, talking about this, you know, the shoots of uh, the fabric sort of cutoffs and everything, making bricks for building, which is fantastic. Um, I was just talking to somebody yesterday, actually, um, about some students, actually, some design students yeah. that were challenged to make garments out of um, tools in the, um, the clothing workshops. And apparently, you know, the big cards that were the used for, for putting yarn around the uh, yep. big cards, yep. they'd actually sort of soaked and molded these cards and actually made almost like a, a cardboard dress out of this. I mean, that's something <laughs> that strikes me just, you know, off uh, the top of my head now, but you know, that somebody could use a sort of like a, old bits of rejected cardboard from, you know, uh, uh, you know, from, from thread winding uh, to make garments from them. I think that's excellent. You know, that's just an example, but there are plenty more. So we've got, we've got an, a, a similar question um, for the third question, which is, um, uh, and I'll, I'll change it slightly. The question here is which companies um, are, are the innovators um, in this field? So maybe I could ask it two things. So which companies and which people? So if you could start with companies and perhaps finish on companies, people. innovators, um, innovators. Well, you know, I think one of the, the the best ones I talked about them before is, you know, the 1083 with the jeans, the fact that, you know, they they dared to lead to prove that we can make jeans back in France. I think that's incredible. Um, and it's taken a lot of courage because people say, no, no, no. And what I'm doing, you know, making collections from existing garments, people go, no, yep. no, no, you know, it's impossible, the cost of products, you can't do it. But sometimes you've got to just believe and, and fight and work through it. Um, I think what a great thing is on a more scaling level today is, again, talking about Fashion Cube, which is part of the Munier Group, uh, that they're actually building a denim factory here in the north of France, that they're mm -hmm. daring at a, a larger scale to do that. And also at a market um, positioning, which is a little bit lower, so it's even more challenging to offer garments at a, at a lower price point. Um, I think that is a huge investment and I think all credit yep. to them doing that. Um, you know, somebody like LVMH, recently LVMH have opened up the doors and the market on their uh, end of series uh, fabrics. Now, they're the sort of things that normally was completely behind lock and key. They were their treasures and the yeah. fact that they're saying, okay, your designers, your startups, your small, you know, designers, we've got these sort of end of series fantastic fabrics. We'll sell, sell them off to you at a, at a cut price rather than them being burned. So, so I think kind of open sourcing their expertise to well, yeah, well their expertise at least designers. their resource. You know, they're fantastic fabrics. So I think yeah. the fact that they're sort of you know um, open to doing that, which was one of their treasures and sort of intellectual property before. Yep. I think that's a, a great move and it's a bold move. And I think to see them doing that in terms of companies, it's, a, it's an example. Um, and in terms of people, in terms of people, um, Stella McCartney has been, even if it's a young lady who's had a, a you know, obviously a lot of boosts having a, a surname as she has, uh, she's been an absolute uh, sort of militant, vegan and uh, responsible fashion designer for many years. Uh, yep. She's somebody I've, uh, somebody I've got a lot of time for, would never have real fur, uh, hasn't had real leather, has always been vegan leather. Um, Christopher Rayburn, uh, sorry, French people online here. I'm talking about a lot of, of English people here. Christopher Rayburn is somebody that I appreciate a lot, has done a lot in terms of upcycling and is very creative in terms of circular design. Um, you know, there, there, there are several in France, there's people like Marine Serre as well. So 
I think there are a lot of designers, you know, look at Vivian Westwood, actually, you know, she was always, you know, against sort of animal cruelty and, you know, human and, and fighting for human rights. So I think there've been some bold people as well, who for a long time have been putting a lot of energy into saying, you know, the fashion needs to, it has a huge am, impact on people, on yep. people's lives. It's very visible. Now let's make sure that the impact is the right impact. Okay. But the list is long. I could go on. There's just a few examples. And sorry for those. I've forgotten. That's, that's, fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. So, well, we, we, the hour is here. So um, we have another Ryan Carson, founder at uh, Revive Clothing Lab. Thank you ever so much. That's been really, really interesting. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, and I uh, hope the audience has enjoyed it. And obviously we'll be posting this on our YouTube um, channel. So, so if people want to run through it and look through it again, then it will be there um, for them to, to, to do that. Ian, can I just interrupt you? There is a yeah, quick no question there. I'd like to reply to, there's Claire who mentioned yeah, her, she's talking about fast fashion, you know, sort of uh, Zara trousers, 39.99, yep. 15 euros on AliExpress. You know, I think what might be good is that, you know, our youngsters have got a lot of access to internet now. I think it would be good that they see some horrible pictures of kids their age who are in awful conditions in awful factories uh, making these garments, you know, put them in the shoes of somebody, you know, live their lives, you know, you're a 15 year old girl, okay, would you like to go and work in a factory and be abused by, you know, the factory owner and not get a day off and all this sort of thing just to make these trousers you're wearing. Uh, so I think some maybe shock factors there to sort of make them realize the true price of a label. But also say, you know, there are different ways of doing things, you know, why not be creative and, and you know, design your own or recycle your own. Look at the secondhand market. Secondhand is booming. And that is another way to still be very stylish, but not sort of force more cheap garments on the market. Hope that replies to you, Claire. Hey, and, and sorry, Claire, I didn't see your question come through. <laughs> so perhaps I'll ask, does anybody else have a question? <laughs> Last I, orders. Wind the, <laughs> before I wind the event up. No? I don't think we've got any more questions coming through, but um, yeah, thanks for everyone who sent the question in. And like I say, thank you ever so much, uh, Yolande. That has been really interesting. Really enjoyed that. So um, um, looking forward to talking again soon. And like I say, um, the event will be on our YouTube channel. Um, so people want to go back and uh, um, look at the event again, or if people have got questions that they want to ask about the event, then you can communicate with us through LinkedIn and, and um, by all means, we'll pass your questions on to let you land. And I'd be really pleased if anybody, particularly um, Sonia, I know you're involved in the fashion industry, people who are involved in the industry and who'd like to do another event, um, then we'd be more than happy to do it. That's great. With pleasure. And thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you, everybody, for, for listening and participating today. It's been a pleasure. That's great. Thanks ever so much. And, um, well, we'll speak soon. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. All the best. Bye-bye.